Thanks, Mr. Sullivan, for joining us. Now, the first question is, what are the key challenges you see to freer trade across the world? Well, I continue to believe that the, the global consensus that free trade is generally a good thing, with certain caveats and, and qualifications, has actually held up remarkably well. Of course, you have to put some qualification on that, because while free trade does bring benefits, it also brings uh, adjustments and costs. And whereas the benefits are spread rather widely, the costs can often be very local, either regionally or sectorally. And clearly, I think no democratically elected government can promote free trade without simultaneously demonstrating that they have the accompanying policies that go with that, whether it is a social safety net, whether it is health care, whether it is education and training to enable people to adjust and move to new jobs. These policies will be indispensable to persuading our peoples that free trade really benefits everyone and not just a minority. Now, climate change, there's a huge debate over it, and it's going to put further restrictions on production capacities across the world. Do you think that this will affect trade? Well, you're right. I think uh, the, the debate about climate change and trade is going to be the next, uh, next big challenge. Uh, I must say, I think we in Europe are very sensitive to the fact that it's not very fair to say to the emerging developing countries, uh, you must cap your carbon emissions. Uh, without taking account of the fact, of course, that for many hundreds of years we've been polluting the planet uh, uh, and we're now, we're now faced with that legacy and not the legacy of, of what some of the developing countries have been done, doing. However, I think it is in all our interests to try to build a global consensus about how we reduce carbon emissions, without which we know we're heading to uh, some serious climatic difficulties, much of which will affect the developing world more than the developed. So the developing world also has a stake in this. But but we have to find a deal which is balanced and which enables the developing countries to continue to grow, to produce the, the additional wealth which they need to move from poverty to, to prosperity and to, to offer a better lifestyle to all of their people. But in a way, perhaps we can, they can find a better way of doing it than simply replicating the very torturous path that the West followed over 200 years. Now, the key question which everybody is asking in, and you're in the right position to answer, when will global trade rebound, what will global trade depend on for it to come back? I think trade is very simply dependent on the overall level of economic activity. The fall off in trade that we have seen in the last 12 months has been exclusively due to the fact that there's less economic activity. Uh, growth figures have fallen dramatically uh, across the world, therefore there's less trade. Once those growth figures pick up again, there will be more trade. There is no, there's nothing in the, the recent fall off in trade which has to do with protectionism or with uh, resistance to globalization. It's a simple, simple mechanical relationship between uh, a downturn in economic activity and then less goods being traded because less things are happening economically. Now, there is a sense of victimization across all communities and all civil societies across the world that globalization is somehow hurting them and there are no benefits. Now, how can this perception be tackled? Well, that's why I think the, the theme of this seminar here in Salzburg, in the Salzburg Global, Se Global Seminar, is absolutely perfect, which is about combating protectionism and how can businesses and governments better explain and defend the benefits of free trade? Because this, I think, is the big challenge. You're absolutely right. There is widespread public perception that somehow ordinary people lose out from free trade. This is not true. Free trade generates, we have outsourced a lot of jobs uh, in Europe uh, uh, to India and to China, but we've created many more jobs at home precisely because we have outsourced some of our jobs, which has made our companies more competitive, then they're able to create different kinds of jobs uh, back in Europe. And the figures prove this. But of course, it's not what people necessarily feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Equally, uh, in India, many people, poor farmers, probably feel our oh, opening up of markets will mean uh, less prospects for me. So there is really a need for a process of explaining to people why trade benefits everyone and how we can have a global open trading system that is to everyone's benefit, on the condition, of course, that governments are able to put in place the accompanying policies which cushion the, the people most immediately affected from the worst effects. Now, there is a lot of uh, development that we see that there's an increase in number of FTAs across the world. How will this affect the multilateral trading system? Well, of course, our top priority, and I think India and Europe share this, is the promotion of the multilateral system. The multilateral system is the, the best outcome. 
the bilateral uh, trade deal is always the second best. But there are things that you cannot do in the multilateral system. Uh, the multilateral system has restrictions in terms of it deals with classical trade barriers such as tariffs uh, uh, and in, uh, agricultural subsidies, but it doesn't allow you to deal with uh, non-tariff barriers, with regulatory barriers. Uh, uh, it doesn't really take you very far in services, an issue which could be a, a huge growth area between India and, and the European Union. It doesn't take you into issues like government procurement uh, and investment, where again, when you look at the figures, the, the investment flows between Europe and India are far below what you would expect, given our relative weight in the world economy. All of these areas could be opened up to our mutual benefit through a bilateral free trade agreement. Also, can you tell us about the status of the Indo-EU FTA negotiations have been on for a while? How soon do you think that this will be concluded? Well, we launched the negotiations about two years ago. Uh, we have made good progress. Uh, we are intensifying now with the new government and the new trade minister. We are now reactivating and intensifying the negotiations. I hope that the upcoming summit in November will give additional impetus. And our mutual objective, I think, is to try to conclude this, the, this agreement by, by, by the end of next year in, 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 in 2010. It's a, an ambitious objective because uh, there will be some difficulties uh, and some tensions in the negotiations. Uh, but I do believe that there is a complementarity between our respective economies which will enable us to have a, a good mutual outcome and which will take full account of the fact that India is a developing country. We know it's not the same thing as negotiating with Canada or with Korea. We are negotiating with a developing country uh, and I'm sure that the outcome will also reflect that reality. Now, there is a lot of debate about the fact that the benefits of globalization is not being talked about in the right manner and people feel that somehow they are being alienated by the entire globalization process. Now, what role can a platform like the Salzburg Global Seminar play in ensuring that people understand the benefits of globalization? Well, I think the composition of the people who are here this week is very interesting. Uh, they're not just uh, trade specialists, but they're uh, sociologists and uh, political scientists and people from business. And I would hope that maybe by the end of the week, one of the things they could start thinking about is how could you have a sort of narrative about trade that is uh, easier to explain. Sometimes the trade specialists are badly placed to do this because we're so close, we only see the detail, we only see the, 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 the battles won or lost. Uh, but I do think that you need a kind of toolbox which won't be developed this week, but which maybe people could start to think about. And maybe the Salzburg Seminar could do another one, bringing together some communication specialists to think about how do you develop this toolbox from which politicians, opinion makers could draw to say, look, these are the benefits of trade. These are the facts of the situation. I, I would be wary of putting it in the hands of the sort of econometricians and, and the, 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 the scientists who will then produce studies, which once again, you know, you have to read 200 pages and five annexes to prove the point. It's, it's also about communication and it's about political scientists and sociologists. Uh, you need, and, and communication specialists. Uh, it's, it's how you take what we know is a good story, but how you craft it into a story that can be made uh, much more understandable. I mean, it's a huge challenge and I don't, you know, I, I'm outsourcing it <laughs> to the Salzburg seminar because I, I don't know how to do it uh, as a trade negotiator. But I think that is something that could be very, very useful and beneficial to all of us uh, in the next few years. The criticism of trade is facile and easy and immediate. Lost jobs, closed factory, uh, foreigners cheat. Uh, th that's, that's the populist view. The answer is more complicated. It's more sophisticated. And it's difficult to find ways of encapsulating that complexity in messages which nonetheless are easy for, for people to understand. And that to me is something that could be taken forward beyond this week maybe in, in further work here to see if we can develop this toolbox, which I would love to see developed for myself, uh, of how we can better sell the benefits of trade in a more understandable way with examples, with, uh, with facts and figures, because this, it's a good story. It's a very good story. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.